All right, this is The Madman of Piney Woods by Christopher Paul Curtis. Uh, this is the second half of chapter 19 or 20. I can't remember. Anyway, this is, they're out in the middle of the woods about to hear some scary stories from uh, the madman. And uh, here's something he said about uh, what kids should or shouldn't believe. He says, these young and starts up having paws at anything they mom and pa say. And can't no one blame them neither because they mom and pa be telling them stories about ghosts and Easter bunnies and the most ridiculous set of nonsense. And they tells them with the same straight face that they tells about not hurting no one else or treating folks the way you want to get treated. And I just thought that was kind of funny because he's saying that stuff like talking about the Easter bunny and stuff like that uh, is a good reason for kids not to believe their parents. And so it's, uh, I never thought of it that way. Um, so we're here, we're doing the conclusion of the chapter. He stopped. Every eye around the circle was locked on him and every one of us waited. Yes, sir, I got told about the ghosts in the woods will come out at night too. But if all the young, if all, if y'all, if y'all youngsters is smart, that there is your first clue that these is lies. Any time someone start their story by saying it happened in the darkness or fog or smoke, anything what cloak with their words, you need to be suspicious about what follows. Darkness hide a whole lot of things, but in talking, it's used most of all to hide the holes in the words of whoever be talking. Darkness, real demons and monsters and devils ain't got to wait on no darkness. Darkness? Darkness. <laughs> Their work get done as much at high noon as the black at the blackest night. They ain't no respecter of the amount of light washing over the earth. They're going to get done what they need to get done. The madman's voice changed. It became steady and near monotonous in the exact way Mrs. Brown warned us against during forensic lessons. I had no idea if the other boys were feeling what I was. All I could see, all I could hear was this man with a huge head of wild hair. I seen devils and demons and beasts and mostly I seen monsters. I seen how they walks upright on two legs. I heard them talk and they sounds a whole lot like you and me. He stopped and I realized I'd been holding my breath. Mr. Swan said, uh, thank you. That, uh, uh, Willie, let me finish. These here boys wants to hear about monsters and they ain't got no idea these inviting them monsters right into their hearts. I seen how they likes playing war and soldiers in the forest. I seen how they crashes around hollering and frightening everything living in the woods. Let me tell them. Let me tell them what no one ain't had the sense to tell us when we was young and excited by that foolishness. They need to know what they's playing at. There was no stopping this. In the same manner that water in the Niagara River gets to a certain point and its fate is sealed, the madman was unstoppable in pulling us into his nightmare. He moaned, let me tell y'all about who the monster is and where they be hiding. It's going to be a big surprise, I promise y'all. I always looked younger than I was. I just turned 17, which was old enough to join up as a soldier, but they thought I was 13 at most and would only let me be a drummer boy. I knew at first what chance would come, I'd throw that drum down and pick up a rifle and kill me some of them Johnny Rebs. I knew it was going to happen, but I sure didn't think it would happen as soon as soon and in the way it did. I got attached to the 6th Regiment Colored Artillery out of Mississippi, and the day I did, we was in a skirmish at Vidalia. It near cost me my life, but it opened my eyes good. We got charged by the Confederates right after they shot us to tatters. I dropped my drum and grabbed the first dead man's rifle I seen. The sergeant told us to prepare bayonets, but them Rebs was the top of us before I got the chance to get the bayonet fixed on my rifle. The man next to me got a hole blowed in him, and the sight, of it, sight made me drop my rifle. I run. I ain't ashamed to say it. I run. I run down a little swale and could hear a reb right behind me. I didn't get 30 yards before a root reach up and grab me and drop me on my face. I felt the reb's bayonet poking my back. He shouts, 
Turn around, darky. I ain't never shot no one in their back, and I ain't about to start with you. I want to see your eyes when you die. I turned over, and the rifle was pointed between my eyes. I stayed, so, I stayed still to give him a clean shot, but he lowered his gun. He looks at me and says, Why, you ain't nothing but a baby. I got kids at home older than... The madman of Piney Wood stopped talking. When he started again, his voice was dead. He said, that's when I found out where r the real monsters was hiding. That's when I seen who truly was, a de who was truly a devil. The man reached his hand down to pull me up. I didn't even know I hadn't dropped the bayonet. I swung at him and it seemed like his chest welcomed it in. That easy and that deep must have pierced his heart. He fell atop me and bled out right there. I know right then that I had good cause to be afeard of all the monsters I got talked about. I know right there that devils is real. I know I should be afeard because I was carrying the devil round inside of me. He weren't hiding in no darkness. He was me. All he was doing was biding his time, waiting for a sign, waiting to come out. I was dumbstruck. I waited for Mr. Swan to make him stop, but he was stunned as the rest of us. The madman wasn't through. I can't remember nothing what happened for two days. I only know we run them rebs off, but soon I got to see more about them devils. A couple of weeks later at Fort Pillow, I seen more monsters treading the earth, watched them doing their evil work. We was outnumbered bad, four or five to one. Y'all know how in one of them big storms, what blows so hard, the rain be coming at you sideways? That just how the bullets was coming at us from the revs. I was hunkered down, praying that one of them rifle balls would plant itself in my forehead and make this go away quick. If I could have got my hands on a gun, I'd, I'd have done it myself. Must have got grazed and not cold. In the time I was out, the monsters come up on the earth to practice doing they filth. I members opened my eyes and thinking it was over because I couldn't hear no shooting or cannons, but then my ears sharpens and I'm blasted by whales and caterwauls like I ain't never heard afore. I heard wounded men on the battlefield afore, but this was something worst. I raises up and he stopped. I breathed. When he started talking again, his voice sounded like one of the youngsters at school tiredly reciting something they had to memorize. You's half unconscious and dazed and laying on your side and not understanding how come so many of your friends is laying around you with red caps pulled tight over their heads. You might even laugh because you know that red caps ain't no part of no uniform. Then you sees. You sees they's all been worked over by them monsters using bowie knives to cut the scalp clean off them. Seen laying not five feet from me the bleeding head of a man that I was talking to a half hour before the Reds attack. Same man I ate breakfast with that morning. Same man would talk about his family and listen whilst I talked about mine. Then something's got a claw in my hair, snatching at my head, so I rough, I feared my neck's broke. There weren't no real pain. All I feel is something score a line across the back of my neck at the hairline, and I feel metal hitting bone, making a sound I recognize as the same sound I heard a thousand times before when a goat or a pig's getting slaughtered. I looks back up into the eyes of the demon what was scalping me, and he warn't mad nor full up with hate. He warn't in no rage with teeth bared and foam on his lips. He warn't feeling nothing what a human would feel doing this. He was calm as if he was washing his socks at a crick or shaving stubble off in his chin in a camp mirror. Then I feels this terrible sawing at the back of my neck. But the main thing is the sound as the monsters commencing ripping at my scalp. It sounded just like a thunderstorm got trapped in my skull. It sounded like cannons booming in my head. The madman raised his voice as if he had to shout over the sounds. Then it stopped. My head got dropped back down to the dirt. And once the thunder quit booming in my ears, I hears a voice. I looks over and see a different white man pointing a pistol dead at the demon with a bloody knife what was standing astride me. 
They argues back and forth before the one would have been ripping at my scalp, bend back over and snatch my head up again. The person with the gun holler at him louder and the monster growls something terrible back to the gunman and I feels that knife hit bone again. Then I hears a shot and the monster what was stealing my hair fall atop of me with a gaping hole where his heart used to be. I seem to swarm with them other great demons with knives overtake the one with the pistol. Then I passes out. When the madman of Piney Woods stopped talking, his voice echoed in my ears like the fading of a church bell. I don't know when it happened, but something, sometime during a story, he quit looking at the fire and locked onto my eyes again. He misread my look and said, What? Y'all think I was lying? Y'all think I ain't had no truck with monsters? I looked around at the circle, and the only people still there were me, Spencer, and Mr. Swan, who had stood up and was reaching a hand to toward the madman. I ain't afeard of the truth, and neither should y'all be. This is the truth. Look and tell me if I's lying. He stood and turned his back to me and dropped his chin to his chest. Then he used both hands to grab the thick hunk of hair that hung down his back. He lifted his hair as if he were raising up a trap door, showing me and Spencer and Mr. Swan the back of his skull. And that's all that was there, his skull. Where do you thought there'd be more of the thick hair? There was a slice of bread-sized grayish white patch of bone bordered by a band of thickened, shiny black skin. I couldn't pull my eyes away as the madman with his back still to me and Spence said, I ain't got, now, got no clue how long I slept after. When I finally gets up, it was long enough for clouds of flies to be rolling over Fort Pillow like waves. It was long enough for maggots to set up in my wound. I picks as many of them out as I can, then crawls to the river and packs mud on my head to try to cool it down. He laughed and the bitterness of that laugh grated on every nerve in my body. They tell me them maggots and that mud would save my life. I can't say for sure if it was me or Spence who had made the first move toward the bolting. Being much faster runner than he is, I was already in the house with my chest heaving and my back leaning against the front door when I heard Spencer's wails as he ran past. Spencer's howls, my gasps, and the slamming door disturbed mother and father from their bedroom. They appeared at the top of the stairs, father holding a fireplace poker and mother the small coal shovel. Stubby and Patience joined them. She had a carving knife in her hand. Benjamin Alston, mother said, what is the cause for this commotion? Mother and father, I met him face to face. He sat right next to me. Father said, who? What? The madman of Piney Woods. He's been scalped. His skull is showing white as snow. Mother said, this was that Mr. Swan's storytelling? Oh, yes, mother. Is he still there? I don't know, but there's more I haven't told you. Even though I knew they might ban me from going to the forest if, if they knew, I had to admit, I'd talked to him earlier. She said, it can wait. All of you go to bed. All three of us said, but mother. She raised her voice in a way I'd never heard before. Now. There was no thought but to listen. Mother and father didn't even change out of their night clothes. They hopped at the front door, pulling on their shoes, not even bothering to lace them. Mother said to father, hurry, hurry, Tim. What Miss Ennis said must be true. He's starting to talk to people again. That poor man has to be so lonely. Maybe this time we can... They left in such a rush they didn't notice that me and Pay and Stubby ignored mother's order and were still standing on the stairs. The front door closed, the screen door banged, and they were gone. Patience said, Benji, what should we do? I don't know. Maybe we should just go to bed like Mother said. Stubby and Pay had their arms wrapped around each other. He said, you really saw him, Benji? Honestly? Was he horrible? I didn't even have to think. No, he was very scary, but most of all, he seemed, I don't know. I can't describe it. Maybe Mother was right. Maybe the only word to describe him is lonely. Patience said, 
Benji, did he really get scalped? I could see that even Pei was frightened. I suppose it'd be really terrible to hear about this the way they just had. I mean, even mother and father had looked horrified, and mother had roared at us like a lion. It's easy to see how this could shake a young person up. Patience, it was dark. Now that I think about it, he probably wasn't really scalped. It must have been some kind of trick. I felt rotten about how shook up I'd got my brother and sister. I really wasn't doing it only for me when I said, Stubby, if you go get a blanket, we can wait on the couch for them to come home. He ran upstairs. Pay stood close to me and I wrapped my arm around her. She whispered, don't tell Timmy, but mother used to know him very well. What? Shh, it's true. That's why she gets so upset when people call him madman. He was, Stubby charged down the steps, dragging the blanket from his bed. I sat on the couch and Pay and Stubby sat on each side of me. I flapped the blanket a couple of times until it settled over all of us. I felt like a mother when she snuggled under one of my arms and, and she, when he snuggled under one of my arms and she the other. Stubby said, do you remember when we all slept in the same bed and you used to tell us stories to help us sleep, Benji? I sort of did. I used to try to get them to sleep so I could sneak out of the bedroom window and run to the woods at night with Spencer. Patience laughed. I do. They were so funny, and it seemed like I always had good dreams afterward. I began to remember, but my memories went further back than theirs, and they came because I used to feel the same way when my mother would comfort me after a nightmare, or when, they would, or when sleep just wouldn't come. After mother sang me a lullaby or told a silly story, or just let her warm hand rest on my forehead, I felt comforted. I knew there'd be no more nightmares. I knew it was safe to sleep. They waited. I said, all right, I'm rusty at this, but I can try. I remembered they always wanted the stories to start the exact same way. I said, a long, long time ago, even before there were clocks, in a forest so far from here that only eagles know the way there, lived two little trolls named Patience and Timothy. One wintry summer day, they decided. I couldn't believe how easy the story started coming back. Pay and Stubby fell back to sleep much too quick. I wish they'd stayed awake longer. I was left alone with my thoughts. I wondered if he'd been right when he said the forest had judged me and him to be just alike. I think that's what scared me the most about seeing the madman at the storytelling. Not his wild eyes, not his scalped head, but the thought that he was right. Could that be me someday? Had he started out as someone like me who loved the woods too much and that made his mind slip off the tracks? My right arm started tingling and going numb from Stubby's head. I slid my arm from underneath him. No, there isn't any way that loving the woods could make you lose your mind. There had to be something more. Mother said he was lonely, but could that make you go mad? My left arm started feeling like it was going to sleep. I lifted Pei's head. I took the knife she was still holding and set it on the back of the couch. Then I understood. If it was loneliness that had caused a madman, had caused mother's friend to be so disturbed, then I didn't have to worry. I had mother and father and Pei and Stubby to protect me from that. It's funny, while they slept, cuddled next to me under the blanket, I thought about the monarch butterfly cocoons that pop up every fall in the woods. This blanket was like a cocoon, and me and Stubby and Pei were three caterpillars safe inside. I stopped worrying about Mother's friend. He wasn't interested in hurting us or anybody else. He was wrong. Maybe the woods told him we were the same, but the woods didn't know me when I was at home. But he was right when he said I was to be envied. I could do one thing he couldn't. I could leave the woods and come home to my cocoon, my family. Ooh, and now we're done with the first part of the book and we get to part two.